Additional information on the Essenes. There is actually a surprising amount of information regarding the Essenes from sources who lived as contemporaries. Here is a quote from Philo of Alexandria, who lived during the same time as Christ. This translation of Philo comes from a lengthy citation by DuPont Summers, The Essene Writings from Qumran, 1973, pages 21 through 24. Notice how many things Philo describes that the Essenes do that match perfectly so many points of the covenant of Abraham and the 22 parameters established by Ezekiel, such as no slavery, no personal ownership of property, no satisfaction of possessions, no weapons, no animal sacrifice, no living in the cities and loving all peoples. Nor is Palestinian Syria, which is occupied by a considerable part of the very populous nation of the Jews, barren of virtue. Certain among them to the number of over 4,000 are called Essenes. Although this word is not, strictly speaking, Greek, I think it may be related to the word holiness. Indeed, they are men utterly dedicated to the service of God. They do not offer animal sacrifice, judging it more fitting to render their minds truly holy. First, it should be explained that fleeing the cities because of the ungodliness customary among town dwellers, they live in villages, for they know that as noxious air breeds epidemics there, so does the social life afflict the soul with incurable ills. So Essenians work in the fields and others practice various crafts contributing to peace. And in this way, they are useful to themselves and to their neighbors. They do not hoard silver and gold and do not acquire vast domains with the intention of drawing revenue from them. But they procure for themselves only what is necessary to life. Almost alone among all mankind, they live without goods and without property, and this by preference and not as a result of a reverse of fortune. They think themselves thus very rich, rightly considering frugality and contentment to be real superabundance. In vain would one look among them for makers of arrows or javelins or swords or helmets or armor or shields. In short, for makers of arms or military machines or any instrument of war or even of peaceful objects which might be turned to evil purpose. They have not the smallest idea, not even a dream of wholesale, retail, or marine commerce, rejecting everything that might excite them to cupidity. There are no slaves among them, not a single one, but being all free, they help one another, and they condemn slave owners, not only as unjust in that they offend against equality, but still more as ungodly in that they transgress the law of nature, which... Having given birth to all men equally and nourished them like a mother, makes of them true brothers, not in name but in reality. But for its own greater enjoyment, crafty avarice has dealt mortal blows at this human kinship, putting hostility in the place of affection and hatred in the place of friendship. As regards philosophy, they first of all leave logic to word chasers, seeing that it is useless in the acquisition of virtue, then they leave natural philosophy to street orators, seeing that it is beyond human nature except, however, in what it teaches of the existence of God and the origin of the world. But they work at ethics with extreme care, constantly utilizing the ancestral laws, laws which no human mind could have conceived without divine inspiration. They continually instruct themselves in these laws, but especially every seventh day. For the seventh day is thought holy. On that day they abstain from other work and proceed to the holy places, called synagogues, where they sit in appointed places according to their age, the young men below the old, attentive and well-behaved. One of them then takes up the books and reads, and another from among the more learned steps forward and explains whatever is not easy to understand in these books. Most of the time, and in accordance with an ancient method of inquiry, instruction is given them by means of symbols, in parentheses referring to stone tablets, author's notes. They learn piety, holiness, justice, the internal rule, the constitution, knowledge of what is truly good or bad or indifferent, 
and how to choose what must be done and how to flee from what must be avoided. In this, they make use of triple definitions and rules concerning, respectively, the love of God, the love of virtue, and the love of men. Of their love of God, they give a thousand examples by constant and unceasing purity throughout the whole of life, by the rejection of oaths, the rejection of falsehood, and by the belief that the deity is the cause of all good but of no evil, of their love of virtue, by contempt for riches, glory and pleasure, and by their continence and endurance, and also frugality and simplicity, contentment, modesty, obedience to the rule, stability of character, and all similar virtues, of their love of men, by kindness, equality, and a communal life of which, although beyond all praise, it is not out of place to speak briefly here. First, no house belongs to any one man, indeed. There is no house which does not belong to them all, for as well as living in communities, their homes are open to members of the sect arriving from elsewhere. Secondly, there is but one purse for them all in a common expenditure. Their clothes and food are also held in common, for they have adopted the practice of eating together. In vain would one search elsewhere for a more effective sharing of the same roof the same way of life, and the same table. This is the reason nothing which they receive as salary for their day's work is kept to themselves, but is deposited before them all in their midst to be put to the common employment of those who wish to make use of it. As for the sick, they are not neglected on the pretext that they can produce nothing. For thanks to the common purse, they have whatever is needed to treat them, so there is no fear of great expense on their behalf. The aged, for their part, are surrounded with respect and care. They are like parents whose children lend them a helping hand in their old age with perfect generosity and surround them with a thousand attentions. Such are the athletes of virtue which this philosophy produces, a philosophy which undoubtedly lacks the refinements of Greek eloquence, but which propounds, like gymnastic exercises, the accomplishment of praiseworthy deeds as the means by which a man ensures absolute freedom for himself. And this is the proof. Over the course of time, many kings of diverse character and inclinations have risen against this land, some rivaling the most ferocious wild beasts in their cruelty, sparing no source of atrocity, immolating their subjects and flocks, and even dismembering them alive, piece by piece, limb by limb, like butchers, never ceased until they were themselves obliged to undergo the same misfortunes beneath the blow of that justice which watches over human destiny. Others, replacing frenzy and rage with another kind of wickedness, nourishing unutterable cruelty, speaking calmly yet revealing beneath their soft-worded hypocrisy is soul filled with profound hatred, caressing as dogs whose bite is poisonous, these authors of incurable evils left as monuments to their wickedness from town to town, the never-to-be-forgotten calamities of those who had suffered. But none of them, neither the most cruel nor the most unprincipled and false, was ever able to lay a charge against the society known as Essenes or saints on the country. They were all defeated by the virtue of these men. They could only treat them as independent individuals free by nature and extol their communal meals and communal life as beyond all praise and as the clearest demonstration of a perfect and completely happy existence. This concludes the additional information on the Essenes.